Our guests this evening are Crystal Clark and James Horak, and I've got my producer Keith Roberts here. We're talking about Ebola, and I want to get off this topic, but it ha- is pretty darn interesting. Uh, let me read what the CDC is saying about Ebola. Ebola is a rare and deadly disease caused by infection with a strain of the Ebola virus. The 2014 Ebola epidemic is the largest in history, affecting multiple countries in West Africa. The risk of an Ebola outbreak affecting multiple people in the U.S. is very low. So the CDC is saying Ebola is a virus and that this is the largest epidemic in history of Ebola. And you guys are going to tell me neither one of those is true, right? Well, remember what I was saying about the image that they're using. If Ebola is a virus, why do they keep showing you the image of the parasitic worm? That's to produce cognitive dissonance. Yes. And I thought it was interesting that during the break, a snippet from The Matrix was played. And uh, when there is a reality revision, there is a discontinuity in the storyline. And I really love that scene from The Matrix when Neo sees the cat walk by twice and they they want to know was it the same cat and they explain to him that these kinds of discontinuities are telling you that they've changed something and this is actually very very true and I think a very beautiful portrayal of exactly what we're talking about that image of the parasitic worm is in itself a discontinuity in the Ebola virus storyline and it's the only image they have ever used if they have an Ebola virus image why aren't they using the correct image have you guys heard of Disaster City in Texas? No. It's no. a it's a training site for first responders, and they're training first responders in Disaster City to respond to Ebola. And guess what they're using? Robots to respond to Ebola. Now, do you think they're working in the transhumanist agenda here as well? I think they're working in the fear agenda. We'll elaborate on you that. Can't, you, you can't argue with a robot. It comes up, and uh, if you want to take the inoculation, it uh, forces you into a corner and gives it to you. My goodness. <laughs> That's what, I think we're heading to a scientific dictatorship. We're going to see Google cars. They're going to take away our right to drive. They're going to try anyway. And then, of course, the Google brain implant is coming soon. Well, the impediment to the New World Order implementation of course is bricks and uh, it's all over the fall of the petrodollar and that there are countries that want to insulate themselves from those effects and have have joined with uh, all accepting and giving uh, gold back currency for oil and you see this is the greatest power shift in the west that we've seen since world war ii and the reason that it is so threatening to the powers that be in the West, namely England and the United States, is that it will shatter the value of the currency here to as low as they'll allow it. And uh, that, that uh, they call it an adjustment. It's on the horizon. And so they are speeding up all the nastiness that they've been employing in a lessened way with gradualism in order to cram it down our throats before we understand we have options. And we do have options. We have options today. We didn't have options. They would have enacted this before 2000. Uh, You remember the H1N1 virus? That was the first attempt to do what they're trying to do with Ebola. Crystal, any comments? Yeah, I agree. I think it's I think the entire thing is more nefarious than that judging by the mindset of the people behind it because these people believe themselves to be and, and there's a lot of cognitive dissonance in this too. They believe themselves to be a superior race of humans uh genetically. They believe the rest of us to be an inferior race of humans that are aimlessly wandering around like automatons waiting for meaningful input from a higher intellectual source that will give us something productive to do and they believe that they are that source that that higher intellectual source Uh, now 
this is, of course is not true you know this two different species it's it's a you know it's a it's a delusion but i think that the point of transhumanism is to eventually make it true and i do believe that uh in even in the context of reality revisionism uh that we talked about before a, su- a a successful reality revision requires the elimination of the competition or competing reality which is quite often is the truth and i think that vaccines that change the way our bodies function uh how long we live and and on and on i think qualify as elimination of the competition uh which i think is part of the goal of transhumanism i think it's very nefarious uh you know it's very interesting because hitler was very uh, focused on the aryan master race which really he was not a part of the aryan race eugenics no he was he was uh this was uh more than anyone else, Himmler, and it was an aspect of ethnic racism, very much like what you see in the Zionism today. And uh, go ahead. You well, to say d- don't don't you think that maybe there was an element of self hate here with Hitler? No, I think there was one element that no one ever talks about. He had a Zionist doctor that uh, was uh, feeding him methane amphetamine. And telling him it was vitamins. Oh. Well, he had to be able to look in the mirror and see that he wasn't blonde-haired and blue-eyed, right? Well, there are a lot of Jewish people that aren't. They're more Arabic than they are anything else. Well, didn't Hitler actually have some Jewish ancestry? Yes, he did. Now, that is fascinating. Now, psychologically, I mean, talk about cognitive dissonance. He was also a good artist. He was a great artist, right? Well, I don't know, great. He was good, yeah. Well, he, he was uh, an impressionist, uh, which was uh, uh, that German impressionism uh, is, uh, well, I'm very fond of it, you know, so I'm rather uh, biased, but uh, not towards Hitler, of course, but I'm biased towards German impressionism. Well, and he was a good German impressionist. And think about the tremendous power of persuasion that guy had. Well, you have to understand that he actually did bring Germany out of the dregs of massive inflation and depression at the same time and restored national sovereignty, restored national pride, and uh, he changed, just like Napoleon. You have to understand that when these leaders have that much power, uh, the infiltration machine of their enemies has to be very sophisticated. And I've explained how it was in terms of Napoleon, and it was equally in terms of Hitler. Crystal, I know you had something to say there. Go ahead. Yes, we've all heard the phrase that the winners write history, uh, and this is very, very true. You know, we've seen films that portray, uh, you know, rulers that conquer a nation and they uh, strike the record strike the names of certain families or events from the historical record and alter it and there is a it's a six and a half hour documentary about Hitler called the greatest the greatest story never told it's on YouTube and this is so mind-blowing that it will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up because if we can go back to the patterns that these people use and it's always the same pattern Like you were talking about a a moment ago with a technological dictatorship, I'm convinced that the reason for the surveillance is not finding terrorists. It's looking for the dissenters and heretics from the official narrative so that we can have the new witch hunts, and they're going to start branding people that won't go along with the party line as terrorists. And we've already seen that shift. We had homegrown terrorists, and now we have nonviolent extremists. And there is a shift in the language to, well, we're going to have to do some social media vetting and, and, you know, determine who's going to be able to go online and who isn't based on their views. And I think Hitler was an excellent case and probably the the least well-known case of someone who was vilified and turned into an enemy when, in fact, I, I, I believe the documentary makes a very convincing case that Hitler was actually trying to save his country from Zionist infiltration and mentioned as much in his own speeches. He had, he had Muslims 
in his army. He, they have their own uh, Muslim leaders, their, their own squadron leaders. There are images of the, of the beautiful um, Quran that he gave them. He had Jews in his and the, army. And, the, and he had Jews, Jews in high-ranking positions. That's right. He was not a, an anti-Semitic. He was anti-Zionist. He, I mean, it's 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 powerful. I will tell you, it's a very very powerful documentary, and I can't recommend it enough. Well, the thing that people don't realize about Hitler, Hitler and the Thule Society knew about our previous civilizations. They knew about Atlantis and Lemuria. They knew about our real history. They were trying to find out about our real history, and that may have been why they were vilified. What do you think about that? Well, in many aspects, that's true. Uh, they had a group of scientists go to, the, to Tibet, go to Mongolia, uh, that uh, were doing archaeology work and uh, trying to study uh, certain people that uh, uh, are remarkably anomalous, especially in Mongolia. I just wanted to ask uh, Crystal uh, the name of that documentary again. I'll go find it and post it in chat. Sure, it's wonderful. It's called The Greatest Story Never Told. And ironically, a lot of your listeners are going to find it's been banned in their country. But if they do a web search for that same term, they can actually find the website, the original website, and, and may be able to find versions that they can view in their country. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's very interesting. The Thule Society, they knew about this, what we call a mythical northern country called Hyperborea. And they knew at one time that the poles of our planet were, were very, very different and that we had a lost ancient land mass in the extreme north. Um, and they, they knew about Plato's Atlantis. Uh, can you d discuss that at all, James? Well, if you want to find, uh, first of all, Atlantis uh, was more than an island. It was a civilization. Uh, it, uh, it was so immense that uh, it used uh, plots of land in the Amazon basin, which you can find today. They're terraced. Uh, they're irrigated. Uh, and there's over 160,000 of these. Uh, they're roughly a little larger than an acre. And this was where they grew their food supply. Uh, they were very advanced. They had an ability to store food uh, through famine and through uh, uh, problems that might arise from uh, volcanoes erupting, uh, where the ash uh, will just spoil a crop. Uh, they had... Uh, uh, envoys, they, uh, they are responsible for the first uh, uh, buildings in South America where you see uh, what is mistaken for all Mac. And uh, you, uh, you find uh, that uh, they had a very precise method of cutting stone. Uh, they had uh, uh, airborne airships. They had a number of things, but that that's just one lineage. That's just one. Uh, 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 they they did uh, have a conflict with the blondes, and uh, that's what led to their rapid demise. James, do you think that the Germans slash Nazis with the Fool Society, that roughly around World War II time, maybe a little bit earlier, developed a kind of anti-gravity or electro-gravitic craft? Uh, well, that, they weren't the first. Uh, of course, not even in this timeline or in this this lineage, they weren't the first. Uh, a lot of people have developed uh, wafers that they could float in the air and direct. Uh, there was a watchmaker in uh, a part of Europe, a uh, mountainous part of Europe, that... Uh, found a geometric configuration and made a watch that uh, had gravitic power and then it started boring through the ceiling until he took a sledgehammer to it. <laughs> he took that design, he took that design, he made a, a UFO and this UFO had the capability of going up as far as he wanted to go. It wasn't capable, of course, of 
protecting anyone outside the Van Allen Belt. But of course, uh, it would it was, and he had a lot of fun with it. There was a story in Fake Magazine which I checked out, and I found relatives of the people that were involved in this particular uh, little item, and uh, mentioned it on a, in a Kevin Smith show. But uh, when I checked it out, it checked out. What happened was these people in this village where this watchmaker lived. Uh, we're out having a, some kind of, in a meadow, having some kind of a, I'm sorry for the noise, had uh, had a celebration of some sort, and uh, everyone was wearing their finery, and well, this craft comes down in the middle of the meadow, and everyone goes over, they're surprised, most of them, they don't know about what this watchmaker's been doing. And the door opens, and out steps the watchmaker, and a couple of ladies in their finery, and uh, everybody's astonished, and they say, well, why don't you come in and look at, look it over, and we'll even take you for a ride, and uh, some of the people do. They go in, and it looks like a railroad turnstile with the levers and stuff, you know, very crude, and then there are a row of seats that go around the, the, the center where this turnstile is, what looks like a turnstile. Of course, well, all it does is it moves the, these configurations of gears that he copied after the geometry that that he that he found or that he created in this watch that he was making with a repeater, and so uh, uh, he decided he'd play a joke on. So they said, "Well, uh, after it was all over, he said, well, I need some fuel.'" And they said, "Oh, you do? Yeah, go get me a glass of water, which is just a lark." And uh, Whatever happened to that, I have no idea, and and I'm not at liberty to discuss where this village is or I got any contact with these people because they are afraid. The village after that kept this hidden and tried to suppress it, but there was a member of the press that just happened to be among those people. That's how the story got out. <coughs> but they were afraid they'd be accused of fraud and didn't want the publicity, didn't want the curiosity seekers and stuff. Well, and of course, sorry, James, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, That's I, all right. I wonder if we might have been better off if the Nazis had won instead of the globalists being in power because Victor Schauberger, I think, created an implosion engine. And the Vril, during that time, created a levitation disc. And I think there was a craft called the Hanabu that was developed in Germany that was able to actually fly to the moon and beyond. Now, have you researched any of that information, James? Well, if, if that's true, and it could be, it didn't carry anyone because the trick to flying outside the Van Allen Belt or even into the Van Allen Belt is having a metal that can, can be ionized, create a field that can protect the people inside the craft from the maneuvers that uh, any kind of anti-gravity craft can do and the cosmic bombardment that even harms the people that fly high altitude above 65,000 feet. If they don't get radical mineral replacement after they've uh, been on a trip be, be that high, uh, they suffer tremendously. They lose uh, magnesium and calcium and iron and they... Uh, <coughs> also suffer from a lot of destroyed red blood cells because these the small particles that are traveling at uh, very high speeds go right through the, the cell and uh, kill it. And uh, so when when they come back to Earth, you you know, that this is one thing that, uh, that will determine that the astronauts did not get to the moon on a rocket. I mean, couldn't you build a kind of um, a, a magnetic field around your craft or some kind of electronic shield that would help with some of that? Not without a metal that has the perfect grain. Okay. But it has the, the the blondes did do that, right? Yes, the blondes are very advanced, but of course they're members of the extended community. They're civilized. They don't have a barrency. Uh, when you have what they have, uh, you have the ability for one person to hold in his hand the ability to destroy a planet. And you see, we we don't we 
we have individuals that uh, have that heightened sense of responsibility, but we have probably even more individuals that don't. And uh, when you look today at the savagery that runs amok on this planet, we just had a 12-year-old murdered by a policeman. Uh, that's going to go real well when it becomes wider known. Uh, but uh, you have this kind of savagery, and you have no reason for it except savagery. I mean, there's no better way. Well, you have the, the leaders, the powers that be, that enjoy these complications and promote them. And so uh, you have a situation on this planet that is nearing extinction. And I've talked about this before. If you don't change things, if you don't change your leadership, you don't people put people in place that will take a sincere desire to save this planet, you're destroying the Pacific Ocean, you destroyed the Gulf of Mexico, these are food baskets for a large percentage of the humans on this planet. And yet they're, they're problems that are being broached by a few, very few people in the mass media, if any, uh, and you have a number of people on the in the alternative media that don't pay due respect to these problems and apply the significance that they that are due. So, uh, and you have people running around saying, oh, "Oh, if we just love everyone enough, it'll all go away." And you have people that that uh, are corrupted by money that are paid to go after people that say things like we're saying here. Uh, so. Uh, this has got to change, and it's got to change very quickly. We can't sit on our butts anymore and pretend that uh, we can survive if these changes aren't made. We simply can't do that. I'm going to make a, a big jump on topic here a little bit. I want to dive into this a little bit, if you guys don't mind. We can go wherever you want. But I, I did do some research this afternoon. I went back, and I studied ringmakers of Saturn again and and then I kind of went down my own uh, rabbit hole which was extremely interesting uh, but one of the things that Dr. Berggren said in ringmakers of Saturn which I thought was really really interesting he said that evidence is 100% positive that propulsive vehicles generated the inner and outer uh, A-rings of Saturn yeah. And well, he saw he saw this in progress. Yeah, I mean, this is it's really huge. Uh, I mean, people the I, size I, the size of North America. Yeah, I mean, this discovery is staggering. Well, you you know, uh, uh, he was uh, I was in touch with him, and we were talking, and uh, he was. Uh, uh, leaning more and more to seeing these EMVs is threatening. And so I told him uh, that uh, that they weren't. And, of course, when I said it to decidedly, that turned on his alarms. And then I said they'll be seen in the sun, and they'll be seen farming the energy of the sun. And I explained how, why that was so important. And he said, how do you know this? How do you know this? Uh, they hadn't been uh, recognized as in the sun at that point and finally uh, I, I said something to him that ended our relationship although I continued a relationship with uh, his colleague Casey Dawkins and later on uh, when a co former colleague of mine betrayed Dr. Bergman uh, I was the one that uh, informed her and thus Dr. Bergman that he, what he had done behind their back while uh, all the while he was pretending to be helpful and to be uh, sympathetic, and and finally this individual sent me an email telling me, well everyone has their price, don't they? Oh. Well, I don't have my price. Crystal doesn't have her price. Mary doesn't have her price. Jenny doesn't have her price. My my new friend uh, and honored friend uh, Nash doesn't have his price. And uh, Taurus doesn't have her price. These people are beyond that. These are the people that I think of when I wonder about why in the hell I'm here. Are you familiar with Dr. Bergeron's UFO sighting near Pajaro Dunes, California? Yes, off, off, yeah, right, uh, right off the coast of Santa Barbara. Can, yeah, can you and, tell us uh, about what that? he saw? Go ahead. What he saw, what he saw 
Uh, and he has a model of it that he shows when he lectures, or when he used to lecture. Uh, now that is an appendage of an EMB. And it is, uh, it's not an energy body, it's not a living thing, but it's an appendage. And uh, believe it or not, that was tailored as a demonstration for him. He described these balls of plasma that were coming out of this craft that were forming these streamers. And he said the streamers were chartreuse in color. What a yeah. shock, shocking visual image that must have been. It was, and of course it uh, awakened him to many things because it reaffirmed uh, so much of what he saw. He never had any of his colleagues, other scientists, try to debunk him. The only people that worked overnight and through the day to do so were ufologists. He tried. Uh, he would go to these UFO conferences with Casey, and they would get a table, and he would try to make connection with with Richard Hoagland. And then Richard Hoagland and his people would shun Dr. Bergman. Now, bear in mind, Hoagland is not a scientist. He he has played the part of a a, rep, a consultant, but he's not a scientist. And Dr. Bergman is an esteemed scientist in his work for both Ames, NASA, and JPL, and uh, recognized an expert in his fields. And there's several. So. Uh, uh, you know, this is to be taken in consideration as to why uh, these gatekeepers are so threatened by Dr. Bergman. They like to, to, you know, they're after money. They're part of the cottage industry in ecology. And and someone that comes up with something that changes everything, changes that paradigm that we hold true to cosmology, uh, someone that does that threatens their, their little realities, their little... Uh, discoveries, their little suppositions, their little proposals about how things work. And of course, uh, they can't take that context. They can't take, uh, they can't take the fact that somebody has jumped light years ahead of them and come up with, with something that demonstrates design, that demonstrates how we can survive being near a fusion star. I'm surprised to hear you say that Hoagland did not want to hear what Dr. Bergeron had to say. Hoagland is a gatekeeper. So are these gatekeepers, are they being paid by globalists? Is, is that what you're saying? Well, you have to look into each, uh, each one for the circumstance that dominates their motivation. And uh, I can guess about Hoagland, so I think that Hoagland has their own people, always had their own people around him. I know that his uh, uh, webmaster, uh, Keith Rowland, was, was dirty. I had conflicts with him. Remember the Enterprise mission? <laughs> yeah. Which was a forum. Uh, I got into a real good discussion with the physicists on that, and it crashed uh, the Enterprise mission. And it stayed crashed for three or four months, and when it came up, it was no longer an open forum. Wow. So, you know, and... and Keith and I got into conflicts with Keith Rowland all the way, all the time. And uh, then I found out that Keith Rowland was also the webmaster for Art Bell. So I knew that Art Bell would go so far and then he'd back off. He'd go so far and he'd back off. And, uh, uh, you know, he never followed anything to, to its full extent. Never. And, uh, I don't think that it was Art Bell because I like Art Bell, and, and so did Kevin Smith. He thought a lot of him. And uh, I think that it was uh, how, I mean, Ke Keith Rowland was, was, uh, was a filter of information that was coming to him. I know some information. I tried to get to Art Bell, for instance, one time. Didn't reach him. James, have you ever done any research on density wave theory? Well, uh, I understand uh, what it implies, what it indicates, and, and what uh, causes people to look uh, use uh, that terminology. But uh, I look at it differently than than people are are uh, the direction people are going today. It's just like with gravity wave. Uh, gravity wave is spoken about, but it's not. No one defines it. I do. And uh, it's quite simple. 
And uh, when you understand gravity wave, then you understand a, a large part of what is behind the drive and navigation of EB craft. And that's something more than these people that are trying to reverse engineer them understand. They think that the weapon that it's on EB craft is a drive, and it isn't. Uh, even Bob Lazar, a very gifted individual and a very, a very honorable person who was right. And uh, who, again, the UFO community, uh, uh, starting with uh, Stan Friedman, I uh, had to debunk at all costs because they, uh, it was one of those things that their handlers didn't want to discuss what, what Bob Lutzor had to say about his experiences at Green Lake. Any comments, Crystal? No, not at all. I'm just I'm, I'm fascinated while I'm listening. Okay. okay. Yeah. James, let's go back to Saturn for a minute because I've heard that the A-ring on Saturn is in part the outer edge of that A-ring is maintained by something that physicists now are calling orbital resonance with the, <laughs> with the two moons, Janus and Epiphemith I guess they call it, I can't pronounce it um, do you have any comment on that? Well, it, uh, it becomes luminescent as uh, uh, cosmic bombardment and light from our star hits it. Uh, what's going on is, is very very simple and of course I would have loved uh, to have been able to discuss with, the, with Dr. Bergman what the point of building those rings are. Uh, their, their rings are around other planets. This is a process, uh, a preliminary process of terraforming of planets in a solar system, you you take matter from uh, from planets and you put them where they can where they can be uh, kept from from roving, and you like you put them in an orbital configuration around a planet like Saturn, and let this uh, solar and cosmic bombardment reduce them down to a point where they are useful for terraforming. And uh, you've heard me speak about the mineral in Nevada that exists in large dumps all over the state. And the only place on Earth where they're to be found, and it's uh, how efficacious it is to complex tissue, and it is, but it is vital for life to begin on any planet. And so when, uh, when this is, uh, uh, to, when a, a planet or a moon is to be terraformed, uh, this is the source of the terraforming. It's taken by the MVs to back to that planet or that moon uh, to originate complex life on the environment that's friendly for complex life. And of course, it is a building block of all life on every stellar body. It always has been. Dr. Bergen said that the rings were much thicker where the EMVs were. Can yes, you, yes. Can you comment on that? Well, it's very important because in the last uh, 50 years, the question of the survival of this planet and what this planet will become after the seventh extinction has been uh, discussed uh, far and wide among the extended community and this is a preparation for if the worst outcome comes about. Now, there are also divisions in these rings. Cassini. Yeah, the Cassini being the foremost. Yes. It was a Cassini, it was a Cassini that uh, Dr. Bergman used in order to triangulate the size of the AMVs that were at each termini of the A ring. And that's what enabled him because probes had been there, uh, and uh, they, he was able to determine the size of the MVs as being the size of North America. And one of the reasons they sent the Voyager program, the two unmanned space missions, the Voyager 1 and the Voyager 2 out there, is that they were trying to take advantage of this favorable alignment of the planets in the late 1970s. So those spacecraft could make one pass, and they could they could look at Saturn, and they could look at Jupiter. Is is that true, James? 
Yes, but it, uh, even in 1970, or as early as 1970, they had the capacity of placing a spy satellite around Saturn that would have given them more complete data and would have kept giving them complete data for an indeterminate amount of time. They had that ability to determine uh, what was on the plane of Sidonia on Mars and to, to actually determine... Uh, the detail uh, at close range of the, the face on Mars, which they ended up uh, lying about ultimately. So uh, uh, they have had this ability uh, ever since the uh, the late 60s of, of putting around planets spy satellites that could do the same thing around any planet in our solar system with the, with the exception of Mercury. Uh, of doing it uh, with rockets that they had at their disposal and uh, and get the kind of uh, uh, surveillance uh, images that they were getting with uh, U-2 and, and with uh, spy satellites that they were sending up as early as 1972. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were kind of a dog and pony show for the public? Well, you can bet they weren't going to send that out. Send they weren't going to share any images that they found embarrassing or images that went against their uh, agenda of limited disclosure. So maybe... Uh, even, we were very fortunate. Maybe even Dr. Berggren got a hold of images they didn't want him to see. Oh, he did. He did. And in fact, I think that if he had ever been able to finish his second book, that we would have seen some images that he had shown myself uh, this other gentleman that betrayed him, and one of the ladies that uh, was a member of our group at the time, we all saw these images that uh, would have been uh, explosive. Uh, these images indicated why uh, the bases on the moon and on Mars uh, were left, where, where the early uh, building of of bases by America combined, combined uh, with the English, the French, and the Soviet Union in America uh, were being uh, uh, built and weaponized. And they were driven off uh, by a fungus that was let loose by ATs that uh, said, uh, you have gone against our understanding, so you're no longer welcome. And that's why we haven't been back to any of these places, and we won't be back to any of these places, because they were able to get there on EB craft, and now the understandings have changed that the EB craft carrying even humans will be brought down. Wow. Um, do you think there was another planet in our solar system that was destroyed in a great explosion? Yeah, uh, that... That's what became the asteroid belt. Was was that planet? And uh, that planet planet was even larger than Earth, and uh, it uh, it exploded, and may, now makes up the asteroid belt. And that asteroid belt is being recombined into something else. And uh, when uh, there was an image of a very large craft, if you want to call it that. It was a furnace that was uh, in the uh, seventh, seventh hour position of the sun. Uh, it seemed to have two funnels going into the past the corona of, this, uh, of the sun and was there for days. And uh, that was a furnace and it was creating the metal for the superstructure of this new astral body. Do you call that planet Malona Phaeton, or do you have another name for it? No, no, of course, uh, no name that uh, uh, that people outside of, of Earth would have for anything like that would would seem familiar to uh, people here today. I mean, there have been uh, there have been a number of things that touch on the tenth planet that uh, have been discussed over the years. Uh, but it wasn't uh, Planet X, it wasn't uh, Nibiru and, uh, or any of the other fanciful myths. Uh, it, it was a, a, planet, a planet that had a nomadic ending. And 
it uh, it uh, it involves some of your ancestors too. Ah, yes, there was a civilization on that planet, wasn't there? Uh, they uh, what they did on Mars was uh, first experimented with on this planet. Oh, and uh, they uh, they were trying to tap the mantle, and there on, on Earth. I mean, on Mars, the mantle was too thin to allow that, and so uh, Mars went into a rapid decline. And when it did, then uh, they spent 25,000 years working out the te- technical complexities of coming to Earth and how to civilize Earth, which was very dramatically uh, savage with uh, vulcanizations. And so that took. Uh, 25,000 years to correct and it was only done with the help of people that lived under Mars on the surface of Mars at the time and uh, lived there no more in fact uh, uh, what's very interesting is that when Tesla was talking about a hall of machines that he could access through uh, ball lightning which would, would make a kind of vortex and he found that there was a communication system already set up to it and he started uh, communicating with these machines that were below the surface of Mars. And uh, just right about then is when his laboratory was burned out. And uh, but he was—he's uh, been the only person to be able to create the ball lightning of that type. And uh, that ball lightning seems to, in many accounts, uh, seems to have a will of its own almost. And but uh, I think, in my own way, I think that it is a form of recording information to be shared later on when uh, people become civilized enough to be able to look in different directions for the sources of principle, scientific principle, that they have failed to, uh, to develop and understand uh, more than what they accept in a mythic way. Um. NASA says that there are some 60 moons around Saturn, but I don't think all of these are moons. I think some of them are. Oh, no. No, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Well, uh, for a number of years, NASA has uh, proclaimed that these uh, migrating moons are uh, uh, anomalous movement moons and all that describe them as moons. Well, the moon has fixed orbit around a body, mostly a planet, and uh, they can't migrate. They, uh, you know, it's, they have fixed orbit by definition. But, but you know, definition and principle and all this doesn't mean anything to NASA is it hides from the truth or tries to hide us from the truth. So, uh, you know, NASA doesn't spend a day of its time without dreaming up the next big yarn to throw at us to hide something that is right before our noses if we would only realize it. Yeah, I think I think some of these quote unquote moons around Saturn are just fragments of this destroyed planet that you were talking about. They could be because uh, that could be in the mix. Uh, EMVs would have to, to arrange for that to happen because anything coming from the asteroid belt is going to develop speed as it goes through a series of larger bodies. That's just astrophysics. Until it progresses to around 30,000 miles an hour. So the group that was on Mars actually was experimenting with this other planet. Did they try to divert an ocean into a volcano? What exactly were they doing when they blew their planet up? They blew one planet up and then they went and did the same thing almost on Mars too, didn't they? What they were trying to do is develop a relationship of energy between uh, a planet's mantle and the sun because that was the only way they understood and they came you know your ancestors came from a binary system binary solar system with two suns so uh, they didn't understand the intricacy of, of how they would have to permutate their technology in order to do it in a single uh, sun system like ours so what they were trying to do basically is is to develop a means of travel so they could go into deep space uh, and uh, that has to do with what you can see around the sun today. Today there is such a means of 
travel, and it was it you could see it plainly uh, before uh, the SOHO satellite uh, in the in those that have access to the raw data coming from the SOHO satellite. Uh, NASA was able to tighten the lid down on the security, so now you don't see it, and it's uh, it's what I I created a name for uh, because Shuni. A very a close friend of mine said, "Well, you got to give it a name," and so I, I ascribed it to Solar Anvil. But it it was prominent in all those images for the better part of three months, and showed up in later images. But it, then again, you know, oh, it's a filament on the lens. It's this. It's that. No, uh, the, it, as that satellite moves, that position of any filament on the lens is going to be in a different place with respect to the same spots on the sun, same position. And the solar anvil is just off the sun at a one o'clock position, and it it takes up an area. It has an arc, which would be about a, a four of the arc of the the elliptic of the sun. So. Uh, it is sizable, but it is used for portage, for deep space portage. That is, uh, bringing uh, uh, ships in from deep space economically. And, of course, uh, at the same time that this uh, privileged data was reaching the public here by virtue of the fact that other space agencies were getting the raw feed and sharing it openly instead of NASA-like, uh, there was uh, 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 some images that Shuni captured of two cylindrical craft coming through and then going out very fast to conserve energy by not having to keep their shields up. And they were very large cylindrical craft. So uh, what, how would you explain that? You would explain that as a craft using a solar anvil portage from deep space. And the solar anvil is a is a portal. It's these ships can jump across these vast distances using this portal. Is that correct? They can go untold dif- distances in seconds. Yeah, it's almost like no time passing. They can just no time passes. But they, it is way to utilize uh, uh, definitively in a, in a certain particular pattern the energy of the star, not dissipating it, and that's the secret of why. You know, you ask any scientist and he'll shrug his shoulders and come up with some stupid answer that somebody has given him because he doesn't want to seem like he does, you know, he doesn't want to seem perplexed because he's superior, right? Mm -hmm. So you ask him, well, how can a star burn for billions and billions of years? He has no answer, really. And uh, the reason is that there is a noble gas, the only truly noble gas, that uh, has uh, hydrogen has a relationship with hydrogen. It's not an element. It's helium. It's not an element, so it doesn't behave like an element. Uh, it should never have been put into the periodic chart of the elements because it's not an element, but it's uh, unique. And what it is is a condition of matter, and uh, uh, it is the most plentiful plentiful form of matter in the universe. And it's created by the sun or by stars. And the only way that it occurs on Earth is as a byproduct of refining gasoline from oil. And even then, you have to really know some trade secrets to to, uh, to be able to collect it and contain it and reduce it to the only way it can be trans- transferred long distances as a liquid. James, we've got a kind of spooky synergy when you and I get talking. It always amazes me. We're almost out of time. We got three minutes left. If you wanted to make any closing statements, or if Crystal wanted to tell people about her website, I want Crystal to make the closing statements and to tell us about her website. If oh. she would. <laughs> well, my website is drowninginabsurdity.org, and James's website is emvsinfo.blogspot.com, and a lot of this information is on there. And uh, I'm glad that James was able to join us because he, like I said, he has he has a view of intelligent design from from the macroscopic level that reintroduces not just the necessity of it, but the beauty of the mind behind it and the beauty of the design itself. 
it's magnificent and I think this again has a lot to do with why we have been uh, relegated to living such such vapid lives not just physically but intellectually uh, the truth is magnificent it's it's inspiring it's it's it, you, there are stirrings in the mind it, there are directions to go uh, questions to ask that never would come into the equation otherwise it's, it's very very beautiful and I'm grateful that James shares it because uh, we do live in a world where these things are intentionally hidden from us on purpose I mean I think humanity ne- needs to get to a point where they will no longer let a, re- a religious cult for lack of a better word hide the texts of our ancestry from us you know it's always interesting too when I get James and you on because it always goes in some other direction than I originally planned because I had originally envisioned us talking about the alternative timeline and then this all happened and somehow it always seems to have some purpose because I always feel like it's never my plan that's executed. It's some other plan that kind of unfolds, which I I, I think is very interesting. I, I do want to thank both of you guys for coming on. It's it's really been a maybe next time, James, we can talk about the alternative timeline. As you wish. <laughs> um. Well, folks. Uh, what we're discussing here is uh, fascinating information, particularly the alternative timeline. And maybe next time we have James and Crystal back on, we can talk about the the chip that was put in Napoleon's brain and the the fact that we're not living on the main timeline. We are in an alternative timeline. So anyway, folks, thanks for listening today. You've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics. And our guests have been James Horak and Crystal Clark. And thanks, Keith. I always appreciate you being the producer. Have a good evening, folks. Wonderful show, you guys. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.